Um, so over to Chris. Thank you. It's delightful to be here with everybody. And um, my sports references will be for only a few people who are still alive who remember <laughs> uh, basketball in the 1950s and 60s. So uh, for the rest of you, this hopefully will be entertaining, if not, <laughs> if not informative. I, I, I was thinking in preparation for these opening remarks simply to say what, what do I think or what do I remember, it's 50 years ago, what do I remember as being essential ingredients to help me uh, become uh, as effective basketball player as I might have been at that time. One uh, aspect I think is um, passion or uh, what the Greeks called eros. We've sort of taken eros over to triple X but uh, Eros meant initially uh, to have a passion for life. In the summers, I used to play um, with the uh, Boston Celtics of Bill Russell fame. There was a summer camp that they had, and it was my job as a skinny young boy to guard Bill Russell every <laughs> night in the uh, games. <laughs> and so Bill would go back and forth and back and forth uh, gently and then for about three or four minutes of the game between the counselors and the Boston Celtics, he would just go crazy and block every shot, make every shot, you know, steal every pass, dribble. And he would turn to me, if some of you remember Bill Russell, he had a giant laugh, the sound of a French horn blasting away, and he would laugh at me. He said, Chris, I just wanted to let you know I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> but he had, I never met a person with such a passion and love for playing. He played as hard on concrete courts in Boston in the middle of the night as he did against the Boston Celtics. So Eros is uh, one important ingredient. Another is coaches. I, I was lucky to have wonderful coaches. It was initially my hope to be like Chris, my uh, fellow panel mate here. Um, I was uh, six foot six and about 130 pounds, if you can imagine such a person, <laughs> when I was in ninth grade. And I imagined in ninth grade being the defensive end of the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> <laughs> they, had a, they had a terrific defensive end, Dave Robinson. I, he was six foot six, too, also. And I said, just like me. <laughs> and he was probably 230 pounds or. I think <laughs> basketball was the right choice. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, uh, so I, I, play, I went out for the JV football team. And at the end of this year, exactly, Chris, my coach said, Chris, uh, you, you have passion, and you have pretty good hands, and for a, a strange-looking human being, you can move around pretty well, but I think uh, basketball would be a better choice for you. And I didn't register initially what he was saying, and I said, yeah, I know, I really like football, though, and he said, but I really think basketball <laughs> would be better for you. So you need a coach who loves you, but who's also willing to point out your uh, limitations, which were many at that time. So he was right. I switched to basketball, and things turned out a lot better. Teammates. Eros, coaches, teammates. Basketball is a team sport. I don't care how good you are, how big, strong, fast, smart, clever. You're, you're not going to get anywhere unless you have some good teammates. And I was very lucky at, um, certainly in high school, but most especially at Princeton, to have very good teammates who also had passion, and we were able to complement each other's weaknesses, I would say. None of us could do everything. Uh, three of the people on our team were drafted in the NBA. Two were first round draft picks, so they were <laughs> a lot better than I. And, uh, but they had weaknesses, and they needed the skinny white guy in the center, and uh, we, we were able to complement each other, so learning your strengths and weaknesses, and being attentive to your teammates' strengths and weaknesses, and learning how never to put them in a position where their weaknesses would show up. How can you always work to serve your teammates so that their strengths will come forth and uh, not their weaknesses? And then finally, I would simply say opportunity. Uh, not everybody has the opportunity to play. And uh, I played a lot of summer basketball in the streets of New York City where I was uh, living. <coughs> Many of the people, because of racism, because of poverty, because of ignorance, never had a chance to play in college, and certainly not in the NBA, even though they were extremely well skilled. So if you have the opportunity, 
how do you make use of it? And once you have the opportunity, how do you expand opportunities for others so that they too can um, get in the game and make use of their talents in a, in a wonderful way for them and forever, for whoever else uh, might be watching. So those are some initial thoughts to help us start it, but I think hope is the real show. So here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I do have to say he sounds like the best teammate one could ever have, and I, I truly do mean that. Um, you make it sound quite easy to be a great athlete and to be successful, but it's not, it's not that easy, and not every teammate is looking to bring out the best in you, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and I not had, everybody gets those, those opportunities. <laughs> so <laughs> you sound like somebody that I would definitely want on my team. So anyways, um, my name is Hope Stevens now, formerly known as Hope Solo. Uh, I grew up in a small town in the state of Washington. Um, I like to attribute some of my success to the fact that I grew up naive. I grew up being a tomboy, playing with the boys, playing with my brothers, thinking that I could do anything mm -hmm. that I wanted to, wanted to do in life. I, uh, I wrote a paper when I was 12 years old. So this is in 1993, I'm 37 years old. So in 1993, I wrote a paper, and our, our teacher asked us to write a paper about what you want to be when you grow up. And I wrote a paper saying, when I grow up, I want to be a professional soccer player. Oh. In 1992, there was no women's professional soccer. It did not exist. So I like to say that I dreamt well beyond what was possible at that point in time. Uh, I put on my blinders, and everything I did was to get to that next level, was to get a college scholarship to play soccer, was to, I was unapologetic about being great, which I think is a problem in this day and age when it comes to kids in sports. Everybody wants the ribbon, everybody wants equal playing time, everybody wants uh, to, to be equal. And of course, I'm an advocate for equality and for equal pay, but at some, at, at some point we have to realize that there are, there are qualities that these young kids can learn through having that desire to be successful, through having that confidence in being great. And as a young girl, I was great, and I was unapologetic about it, and I kept scoring goals. I kept uh, being the best on every team. And it got to a point where I realized it wasn't very popular to be great when I got older. When I got into college, it became I had to balance being a great soccer player and only wanting to play for the US team with trying to understand how to become friends with people when I didn't care to go shopping, when I didn't care to go to the movies together. I wanted to be on the soccer field. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be doing sprints and playing with the, the soccer ball. And, and it just became, it, it got to the point where my competitive spirit wasn't always celebrated. And that continued on throughout my playing career. I ended up playing, followed my dreams, um, played for the United States for close to two decades. Uh, I was a part of four Olympics and three World Cups. Um, and I was able to show my competitive nature on the field for our country. I was able to embrace that competitive spirit. And that's what made me great. I feel bad when I see kids get watered down anymore. Um, I was able to learn who I am through sports, through soccer. I was able to understand what I believe in. I was able to learn how to fight on the field as well as off the field. And now I have found my new passion, which is fighting for equality and fighting for equal pay. I, uh, I was the first athlete to file a federal lawsuit against their employer. I filed the federal lawsuit 10 months ago. It is in federal court. and. It's under the Equal Pay Act in Title VII, um, accusing the United States Soccer Federation for discrimination based off of sex. So I hope, thank you. <laughs> I've realized through sport we can truly change the world. And I'm hoping, unfortunately, sometimes we have to do it through the court system, even though the Equal Pay Act was passed over 50 years ago in 1963. We shouldn't have to be fighting for our rights through the court system, but unfortunately, um, oftentimes those in power don't easily give up that power. 
So we are in the court system, and I do believe that change will come, and that for the future generations, we are going to see equal pay and equality within the sports world. Well, Chris T. and Hope touched on a couple of things that, um, that I want to address. But first, you may be wondering why on a sports panel I've got a 64-ounce soda. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's an effigy of a, of a speaker that couldn't be here this year. He's alive, but he couldn't be here this year. Uh, my friend Joe Sexton. Um, and so I thought I'd give Joe a call. I mentioned the title of the panel. Joe is the former sports editor for the New York Times. He's currently one of the editors of ProPublica. Um, and I think as you'll hear, an interesting guy. I'll have to remind him that there's children in the room. <laughs> Hello? Joe. Yes. How's it going? Good. We're on the panel right now. Oh, well, I'm fucking busy saving the money. <laughs> <laughs> So, so Joe, you have two eight-year-old daughters. Are they are they nine? Eight. Eight. There's children in the room, so. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to cut in too much uh, to my time or the time for the panel. What are your thoughts on reaching the top of your game, competition, companionship, and confidence? How sports help you be your best self? Other complete nonsense. <laughs> Can you elaborate? I mean, look, I mean, you know, what better example for the people there than, than the guy sitting right in front of you conducting this, you know, phone conversation, right? Have you ever seen such a loser? <laughs> <laughs> guy, guy lost his hair. He lost his basic sort of physical fitness. He's clearly lost his, he's clearly lost his integrity. Um, I sat down with him at breakfast the other, the other day and, and asked him to count actually how much money he had lost. Um, by his so-called principled decision to well, leave. Well, Joe, home. it was good uh, talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, 60, and I'll, I'll... 60 million, I think, was the number, but whatever. I'll, I'll stop that by next time I'm in God Brooklyn. Was. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye, Joe. Uh, so I, I take a little bit more uh, critical view of, of sports, um, than I heard Chris share. It wades into some issues that, that Hope brought up. And the way I like to think of it is separating games from sports mm -hmm. and separating the individual experience from the industry. Games are wonderful. Uh, you know, unregimented, free play with your friends in the backyard is wonderful. Uh, it builds confidence, companionship, competitiveness. Um, I think, and I share Hope's concern, is that when the industry gets involved, we see a professionalization of youth sports, and it begins to strip what are wonderful, redeeming, enjoyable games and turns them into something that they're not. Um, it's a concerning trend. Um, more and more we see repetitive use injuries in young kids. We see kids playing 65 basketball games a year. Um, you know, kids who have trainers at a young age in hopes of getting that scholarship later in life. Um, Sports are for us, not the other way around. I'm kind of reminded of that Twilight Zone episode, if any of you are familiar with it, To Serve Man. Anybody? For those of you that aren't, aliens descend and they're being very kind and they're providing nourishment and shelter and sharing their science um, to serve man. You know, at the end of the episode, spoiler alert, you find out that man is on the menu. Oh, no. <laughs> Um, and it, when I see games turn into sports, when I see the industry, you know, influencing science, pay inequity with women's sports, forcing our U U.S. women's national team to play on turf uh, for the World Cup, um, there's a lot of issues like that um, that really strip a beautiful thing uh, that every civilization's had games and played games and turn it into something that, um, that just makes me sad. Um, and I think it's up to players uh, to spearhead the movement to recapture the essence of sports. Encourage kids not to specialize. Um, encourage more unorganized free play. Um, and, and realize that we all know there's folks that, that reach the top. 
whatever that means. And it wasn't redeeming. You know, I've played with awful people. I've played with wonderful men, too. Um, but I, I don't know that there's much evidence that being a professional athlete ensures that you're your best self. I think more often than not, that singular focus that Hope expressed um, means that you lose some, you're not as dynamic. Um, you just lose out on experiences. So I hope we get into a lot of this. Um, thankful to be here. I hope I'm not too dour and depressing, but uh, that's why Joe gave us some laughs. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> So I'll try to, uh, you know, come close to these excellent uh, people over here. Um, I would probably just touch briefly on, honestly, the three things that were mentioned uh, on the panel topic. Um, you know, competition, companionship, and confidence. And confidence, I think, is the one I'll get to later, and it kind of gets into what Chris was talking about, of how sports is, in my opinion, destroying a lot of our youth today, specifically from a mental health uh, perspective. But I'll get that uh, to that in a minute. Um, I'll probably just start with a little bit of my story. Um, companionship, I think, is a lucky uh, area for me. I grew up with a younger brother, two and a half years younger than me, and our parents put us into several, pretty much every sport imaginable, just as Chris touched on here. Uh, there was no really direction, um, strictness on what we would choose or, or how we would play. It was all, it was all games, as Chris, as Chris said. And through that, I developed an insanely competitive uh, I would even say a hateful relationship with my brother, to be honest, because we were always, you know, wanting to beat each other at the sports. Um, but through that, we basically just balanced off of each other all the way up until we were both competing at a very elite level within ski racing. Uh, my brother went to the European Youth Olympics. Um, he was, you know, only a second behind, uh, I don't know if anyone here is in the skiing world, but Heinrich Christofferson, he's one of the, the top athletes today. Um, in the ski world and at that time I was in the world championships competing with the likes of Bodie Miller, Ted Ligeti um, who are incredible athletes and role models in my opinion um, but we really leveraged each other and Sean actually quit skiing and went into soccer he was actually a goalkeeper for uh, his college soccer team um, but that was a really important relationship that eventually made me understand that the relationships in sport are actually the most important facet of how to be successful um, I went to Europe after that, uh, basically my Olympic training um, kind of campaign, and I was in a camp with 15 girls and 15 boys, all from the developing nations of winter sports, of which Ireland was one of them. Um, so you've got kids that have grown up in, you know, war-torn Yugoslavia, you've got kids that have never come from snow before, South Africa, Ireland, for example, um, and you're all there training hard, painful days. Um, in order to succeed and maybe get a chance to compete on the world level for your country. And through that pain and suffering that we, uh, I guess, develop together, you create a, a brotherhood or a sisterhood uh, with these people from all over the world that kind of encourages you. You know, like if you have a, a bad day, someone there is having a worse day than you are, and you should probably be lucky um, that you're in that position. Um, and just kind of moving on from, from that into the most important topic, I think, in sports is this confidence, um, this confidence that is, I think is overly focused in our youth today. Um, you have to be number one from the age of five or six or ten. If you don't get a gold medal, you're, you know, you're being uh, punished by your parents or your school teachers or your coaches. And, and that's the completely opposite way of w where I grew up. It was fun. My parents were spectators. They weren't coaches. The coaches did their job, the parents did their job, which is, to be honest, sit on the sideline. Um, which I think the, the <laughs> world of, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, wor the world of, you know, this, this kind of helicopter parenting is becoming very toxic in the sport world because you have excellent coaches and, and physicians and uh, sports psychologists that have been in this space for their entire lives and they're being overridden because, you know, Johnny didn't get to play as much time on the field. Um, and I think, you know, from a, from a kid's standpoint, then it becomes conflicted. Do I have loyalty to my family? Do I have loyalty to my coaches? And it really plays on the whole confidence level of an individual person, not even an athlete. Um, and just kind of getting into, I guess, my story about that is from a young age, you're always taught that, yes, you're supposed to be successful. You're supposed to be number one. You're supposed to be the top. 
and the Olympic Games was that for me. Um, I flew the flag for Ireland, uh, you know, in the opening ceremony uh, in 2014 uh, at 20 years of age, and I wasn't prepared for that. Um, you know, after that, I had a fractured shoulder. I barely managed to actually compete in my events, and then after that, everything disappeared. And I think that's the one thing I would like to cover in this panel today is the lack of post-institutional support for athletes, for even parents of, you know, how to support their kids after the high period is gone. Um, you know, some of us are in our prime at the moment, some of us are not, but every athlete will eventually have to step off that podium and realize, well, I don't really have sport anymore. I don't have that competition that keeps my mind my, my body focused on a particular goal, um, and there just needs to be more support and more, um, I guess, how should I say, activism from uh, governing bodies to support their athletes long after they're finished their sport. Thank you. Well, I'm struck that most of you are probably sitting in the audience and thinking one of these things is not like the others. Because uh, <laughs> I'm sitting with world-class athletes, including Maura, who is a world-class cyclist. I've never been confused with a world-class athlete. Um, I had a period of time in, in uh, the suburbs of, of Boston where I was a pretty good wiffle ball player, uh, <laughs> but, but never certainly at the, at the level of these guys. Uh, I have had the honor and the pleasure uh, to spend 37 years working in, in professional sports, most of it uh, in Major League Baseball, uh, and I've gotten to see the importance of, of athletes, of both from the youth level uh, uh, and obviously at the professional level. Um, from our standpoint <coughs> as the administrators of the game, thankfully not representing USA Soccer here, um, I can say that uh, everything that we do uh, is focused on making sure that the players have everything that they need to be able to compete at the highest level. Why do we do that? It's because they are the product. They are the people, they are the thing that people come to want to watch. Um, nobody's paid a dime to see me do what I do, but a lot of people who want to watch Nolan Arenado play third base uh, for, the, for the Rockies. And so what we have the responsibility of is to make sure that with its, with whether it's nutrition, uh, whether it's um, you know, the proper sleep, everything that uh, the team can do for that player uh, to make sure that he is at the top of his game is essential for what we do. Um, one thing that Chris said, which is, I think, absolutely true, is the specialization of, of sport ha is a big issue, and it's not just an issue here in the United States. I've been fortunate enough to spend the last 16 years working in Asia, living in Tokyo, uh, and it's a big issue there. There's a, um, there's a mantra in Japanese baseball that um, you should throw as many pitches as you need to throw in order to achieve the goal. Um, the human body is not meant to throw a baseball. It puts pressure on the elbow and on the shoulder uh, that creates um, injuries. Uh, and yet there are pitchers that are held up in high esteem. A guy like Daisuke Matsuzaka, who pitched for the Boston Red Sox, uh, who is, is discussed in hushed tones in, in Japanese lore, because he threw 550 pitches in a four-game stretch uh, in a high school tournament there. Um, that's starting to change. I, I think the good news is I think a lot of people within sports in Asia, certainly here in the United States, certainly at Major League Baseball, where we've worked with Little League Baseball to implement pitch limits uh, going back about six or seven years ago, I think um, we've seen those issues, and we've tried to encourage kids to play multiple sports. Uh, again, straight from a baseball perspective, the more sports you play, the better baseball player you become. The ability to move laterally that you get in basketball, how important is that to play shortstop in baseball? Um, you know, it, 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 it only improves your ability as a baseball player to play more. It also uh, reduces the amount of stress on your body. Um, so uh, again, ju just, you know, uh, we'll turn it back over to Maura, but it's, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be up here with each of you. Um, your stories are very compelling and looking forward to the discussion, so thank you. So I think after hearing all of those introductions, I think, you know, the panel is reaching the top of your game and the subhead is how sports can allow you to be your best self. And so I would be curious from the panel, and we can go 
in any order that you guys choose. So whoever is fastest to the mic or most inspired. <laughs> um, dangerous in this group. Yeah. Um, <laughs> are those two things compatible? Are there parts of getting to the top of your game and being in that very elite echelon and being your best athlete that don't allow you to be your best self, whether that's physically, um, emotionally, in relationships? Well, I'll turn that over to an athlete. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, you've seen a lot of them. <laughs> yes. I, I, um, I would just echo the concern, both as a former player, as a father and grandfather of 10, and as a college president. I think college sports, professional sports, are in a very dangerous position. And so thank you for voicing that <coughs> in regard to treatment of players. Uh, I don't know how it is in professional baseball. I believe sports doesn't help you to become a better person. It will reveal who you are. We were playing in a game against Harvard. The Princeton-Harvard game had a certain mystique to it. They were, frankly, I hope there are no Canterburyans here, but they were not very good. <laughs> and uh, we went into the locker room at halftime. We were up maybe 10 points. We should have been up, you know, like 100. So our coach, Pete Carrill, who is a fiery man uh, and one of my dearest friends, turned to me and said, uh, he knew I was preparing at, to become a Lutheran minister. It sounds kind of strange in the world of sport. But he turned to me and said, how can you believe in God and play that way? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know quite what to say. <laughs> But I could tell by the blood vessels coming out of the top of his head and neck, he was upset with me, so I thought in the second half I better pick it up a bit. <laughs> but I think that moment uh, was very important, uh, uh, certainly for me and for my other teammates, all of whom remember it 50 years later. We had a little reunion the other day, and I said, Chris, we remember in the locker room at Harvard where the coach got after you. But um, so I. I don't, uh, there is a notion maybe from the Greeks that uh, athletics will make you a better person. I don't think that's true. I think it will reveal who you are as a person and in other realms of life, you need to take responsibility for the kind of person who is revealed on, on the field of play. Uh, but sports in and of itself will not make you a better human being, I don't, I don't believe. And I'd elaborate too, I, I think if we stick with that framing of the individual perspective versus the institution, yeah. with the NCAA as it's run today, you don't have enough time to be a full person. Yeah. Um, do you have true self-confidence if you don't stand up for yourself with the fact that you don't have basic economic rights, you don't have insurance for injuries beyond five years of your career? Um, so no, I, I think it could be compatible um, but things need to change. As it stands today, you know, whether it's with the NCAA, with inequity with, in women's sports, um, you know, steroids in baseball, um, institutionally what the Olympics does to communities, like what happened in Brazil. Brazil. Yeah. Um, it's a shame when, when all of these truths you've heard we, us speak about in terms of the value of games confronts the reality of industry. Um, so I, I think it is, I agree with Chris, we're at a pressing time for issues of you know, subsidized stadiums, uh, what the Olympics does to communities, uh, rights for college athletes. A lot of these things need to change. I think athletes can, can spearhead the movement. So yeah, I 100% I agree, uh, agree uh, with what both Chris's have said. Um, I'll probably push back a little bit just on the, there is, I think there's a positive thing that comes from sports, especially if I look at it from just my own story, from a youth perspective, it's taught me a lot of things that have echoed in my, the rest of my life, my professional career, for example. Um, it just teaches you self-discipline. It teaches you dedication, it teaches you hard work and resilience and how to come back from failure, um, which I'm still going through that journey now. You know, I've, <laughs> I've been able to, you know, it's, for example, if I go back to, to ski racing, um, you know, during the training camp for, for the Winter Olympics, that was basically two years, 
it was six days a week up at probably 4.30 in bed at nine nonstop. You might get a half an hour of television, maybe Netflix that you could, uh, could watch, but it was ski training onto physical training, then video analysis, and then you had to prep your, your damn skis for the next day. Um, but that taught me that hard work eventually pays off. It's all those little small victories that you do each day that eventually leads you to the stage of an Olympic Games, a gold medal, a, a World Cup. It's those small little victories every day. And that's what I think the youth of today can be taught is, okay, like all it takes is getting up in the gym in the morning. That's the first step. And then let's just set another little goal of squatting a certain amount or, or scoring your first goal. And that I think can be very positive for the youth today. Um, not that it's first or second or third, but just those tiny little daily victories that become habit. And then they can be used for positive change in yourself and in others. And just, just to add one thing to that, you know, the, the, the amount of people that are able to do what these guys did is, is tiny, tiny, right? Sports is way more than the tip of the iceberg with the NCAA or with, you know, the N NFL or, or, or the NBA or any of those organizations. And so there is so much positive that comes that we've seen with sports, that we've seen, and again, from my standpoint, uh, in Asia where we're giving um, boys and girls self-esteem, a place like China where um, women don't get a chance to play sports, we incorporate um, women's programs into everything that we do. Um, and we've seen the change. We've seen more, you know, self-esteem, more positive, uh, you know, creating positive role models, um, you know, people like Hope. Um, that's really important. So it's difficult to talk about sports if you're not talking about, you know, the, the vastness of it because there are so many different points where sports intersect with, with our lives. I would have to agree with Connor when you go back to youth sports. Um, there's been so much positive that sport has brought to me, so much opportunity. Um, I, I can never look past that. It's helped me accomplish my dreams. Um, I'll always be grateful for that. However, I do think some sports have be become professionalized. So when I became a professional athlete, I was awakened to the problems amongst sport. I was awakened, and, and it really, made me realize that we all are faced with these challenges of who are we going to be as a person? How are we going to address these issues? And what are we gonna stand for? And when you're under the pressure and the umbrella of either a professional sports league or marketing companies, endorsements, you're put in this very, very small bubble on what you can say, what you're allowed to do, and what you can present to the general public. So for the most of my career, I was advised by my agents to go against what I believed in my soul, in my heart. I was advised to do things that I didn't agree with, to pose for Playboy to make more money, to do things that went against my soul. And a lot of this, I think I, I have to, uh, well, I, this probably happens more in women's professional sports than men's pro professional sports because the money that we get paid is much less. So we have to find, I don't know how it is in skiing, but we focus on getting endorsements. And so when you commercialize it and when you're fighting for those few endorsements, you see a different environment. You see crabs in a bucket, yep. people trying to tear each other down yeah. to get to the top. And you have all these athletes competing for little money and it can bring out the worst in people. Sometimes you just become a part of the system, you stay quiet, you become politically correct, you do what your agents tell you to, to do, you do what your sports teams tell you to do, and you're not, you're not allowed to really embrace who you are as, as, as a person, as a human. You don't know how far you can push the envelope to create change in the world. You can wear a t-shirt that says equality, but you certainly can't have a lawsuit. There's, I think it's challenging to be a good person when it comes to money. And when you become a professional, you're in a fight for money, especially in women's professional sports. It's challenging and I think that the few people who can overcome these obstacles become a stronger, better person who can create change on a global scale. But ultimately, I think for the most part, many of our female athletes um, are part of the system. 
And I don't blame them because it's an intimidating world and there's a lot of money involved. So I think money has really ruined sports. Ultimately, it, it usually does come, come down to money. Um, but at the same time, sport can, can really change the world. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Let me follow up. <coughs> and <coughs> my, uh, my sense is that in college athletics, I was on the management council of the NCAA, and what we've heard here from my uh, colleagues is exactly right. So a college president is faced with this decision. Uh, do we allow students to play as many sports as they want? Uh, or do we only recruit students who are highly specialized in one sport? Uh, if I can be more successful with having sports as entertainment and business for my college rather than sports being like play and fun or uh, moral training, I can earn 24 to $1 billion a year. The NCAA tournament that was just played is $1 billion business. And each team gets a small cut of that, 220 million, is divided up amongst the teams in play. I was talking to a college president who remained anonymous from a very distinguished land-grant university. The only reason he was in favor of sports at the level he was, in spite of injuries and in spite of lots of difficulties for the men and women who played there, he was guaranteed from his league $24 million for one athletic program as a result of his participation. So what, who, what's, what's driving this? Um, and, and then the discussion uh, in the Council of Presidents went like this. Well, we have to um, have limits on all kinds of matters of how students can play and how many hours they can play, but completely disregarded the fact that the schools were using the athletes, from my point of view, as pawns to earn money for their athletic programs and uh, at the expense of the athletes, physically, mentally, and perhaps morally. I, don't, I can't speak to that. So I think we're in a dangerous part in college sports. Again, I cannot speak to professional sports or Olympic level sports, but my experience on the NCAA Leadership Council was abysmal. And um, there's way too much money involved, and the money leads to very bad, I would say, anti-human decisions. Let me make one caveat here. The NCAA, as you may know, is divided into three sections. The Division Three, there's no money involved in Division Three. Those are small liberal arts colleges like I was. But I was sitting at the table with mostly presidents from large land-grant universities, which had huge investments. So it was kind of, who invited this tall, bald guy to the party? We don't want to hear from him. <laughs> So one thing that's come up in a lot of um, the comments so far is you guys have made different references to both teammates and relationships with coaches. Um, and I know I think about football in particular and it's interesting because teammates in football are regarded as being part of sort of a lifelong brotherhood. But at the same time, you end up seeing um, a lot of, there's a lot of talk of violence coming out of football and a lot of violence coming out of the culture of being in that environment every day. So I guess from any and each of you, what's a relationship that you've had with a teammate or a coach, either a positive or a negative relationship that shaped you as an athlete? Uh, my freshman English teacher, who was also our wide receivers coach in high school, Dave Ember. Um, coach Ember was uh, relegated to life in a wheelchair um, despite that was the best coach I've ever had and one of the best teachers I've ever had um, Was the first person and I grew up in football crazed Southwest, Ohio um, Was the first person I'd encountered uh, other than maybe my dad and my older brothers um, That could fully embody both an intellectual and an athletic world um, <laughs> Coach Ember uh, actually passed a couple months ago and so I went back and visited but um, No one compares to coach Ember. I love him. So I would 
a <coughs> my college coach by the name of Leslie Gallimore. She's been at the University of Washington for, I think, 28 years now. The longest tenured coach at the university. She's uh, actually leaving next season. But she is so well respected worldwide in the soccer community. But she has never had an incredibly successive, successful program at the University of Washington. Uh, when I chose to go to school there, it was all about Notre Dame, North Carolina, Stanford, USC. The University of Washington was not a soccer powerhouse. But I chose to go there because being a goalkeeper, I wanted to make a difference on the field. So when I went there, we all hated <laughs> Leslie Gallimore. <laughs> Hope she doesn't see this. <laughs> she was the toughest human being on us, not just as a coach, but off the field as well. And she was tougher on us off the field because what was important to her was that she took these young, young adults, basically kids, right? 17 years old, you're, you're still a kid. And you're, you're, you're being influenced by everything around you. And she taught us that it was more important to be great people than it was to be great soccer players. We never had a, a hugely successful program, and we all hated her because she was so tough on us. <laughs> it was tough love. Every single one of us, my former teammates and I, who graduated, we go back and the only one we want to speak to at all of our alumni events is Leslie Gallimore because she influenced our lives in the most positive, positive way. My uh, one quick story for you is my father was homeless in the city of Seattle. He came back from Vietnam and, and he lived on the streets. And he, <laughs> you know, when you go to college, you're a little bit insecure. Like I said, I was 17 years old and everybody's coming from all over the country and a lot of my teammates had money. They're coming from California. And I felt a little embarrassed that my dad would come to the game and he smelled a little off and you know, he had his, his clothes on from the street. And he would go into the Husky Center Circle, which is for the big donors, all the people who put tons of money into the soccer program. And he'd walk in there and he'd stuff his pockets with chips, <laughs> with some hot chocolate during the winter, with some sodas. And my soccer family at the University of Washington treated my father, who was homeless, who was not accepted in society, they treated him like he was every other person's parent, like a VIP. They picked him up. One time, I couldn't get a hold of him. I was worried about him. I thought he was cold for the winter. And my coaches drove me all around the city of Seattle until I found my father. These were the people who really influenced me for the rest of my life. They showed me that I shouldn't be embarrassed of my father, and they loved him for the man that he was. And that's something that will never ever be forgotten in my life. Uh, yeah, just a, this is an incredible story, by the way, Hope. Um, just to echo on what Hope said, um, sport is family to a lot of us up here. Um, you know, the teammates, the, the coaches that you meet and develop, although you may not like everything about them, um, end up being your family for the better part of your life. I mean, 20, 20 years for me even, and I'm only 26, has kind of been involved with coaches and teammates, and, and uh, they are equal uh, family for me. Um, and one, one guy in particular, his name is uh, Alexander uh, Vitanov, a guy from Macedonia, um, who was my coach, and I was 19 when I first met him, and he was uh, just in his late 20s. Um, and the youth and energy that he brought into my coaching really kind of inspired me and made me believe in myself that I was capable of something like the Olympics. And I think from an institutional perspective, that's what we need to actually develop more is more like younger people getting into coaching early, mm -hmm. younger people being advocates for young athletes, because to be honest, they know the current situation better than the institutionalized 70 year old who's been in the same role for 40 years. And again, some people I've met have been in those roles for 40 years and they're still great coaches, still great, knowledgeable, um, lifelong advocates for athletes. But the energy is sometimes missing. In ski racing in particular, there is a massive problem with kind of the, I guess, the old ways of sport. Um, FIS, is the, FIS is the International Ski Federation is honestly, it's all a bunch of old white men who uh, actually, funny enough, deny climate change, which is another story in general. Um, 
<laughs> but uh, you know, dangerous. which is dangerous. I mean, we need snow, right? So, uh, <laughs> um, and that needs to, again, from an institutional perspective, with regards to mental health or coaching, that needs to change. We need to get more youth, like I mean, ages like us, involved in coaching these young athletes, bringing the energy and honestly understanding where they're coming from on the pitch. They're having a problem. The 10 year gap is a lot more easy to reconcile with than a 40 or 50 year gap for some of these athletes. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I was kind of rambling there, but, uh, but this guy just really inspired me to believe in myself and I would even consider him a, uh, a brother. Um, so yeah, thank you if you're, if you're listening. <laughs> I was very lucky, talk about opportunity, to have three terrific coaches who, uh, sort of as Hope was saying, I didn't like them at the time. So 50 years uh, looking back has uh, sabbed a lot of bumps and bruises along the way. But uh, what I liked about them, they were extremely demanding during practice and uh, during games, of course. But when the practices and games were over, basketball is just, there are only 12 of you and a coach in the ancient <laughs> days, we just had one trainer and a bus driver. So it's a small little group and you're traveling around a lot at night. So you, you play a game somewhere from seven, eight, nine o'clock at night, you eat dinner at midnight and then get in the bus and plane or dating myself in the train and uh, go to the next stop. So a very strong bond was created and in spite of the fact that the coaches for whom I played were um, not very nice to us during the days of uh, days of our playing. A strong bond was committed, so we get together every fifth year. And uh, being a minister, some of these people <coughs> have died, and I've been asked to conduct their funerals. Some have been married, have baptized their children. So we have a. We started as sort of skinny, scrawny athletes, uh, sort of unified against our coaches in, in many ways. But over a 50 year period, uh, we continue to be in touch and we continue to love and care for each other as, as best as we can. And I, I would say at this point in my life, that's probably the most valuable uh, part of life. And when we get together now, we don't even talk about the games. Most of us can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> What, what sport was it that we played? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> but, but we have this uh, very strong bond, so it's a great blessing to have, uh, have been through that. So I have a whole bunch more questions that I want to ask these guys, but I have a bunch of questions running, ri coming in from all of you, so thank you for that. Um, and so we'll turn over to some of the questions from the audience. And what I'm going to do is, because I have a lot of questions, um, have one or two of you um, answer each question. So raise a hand if you want to be the one to do it, or grab a mic if you want to be the one to do it. Um, and that way we can get a perspective on a bunch of different things. Um, so the first question is from a student. And it's talking a bit about resilience. And so whether it is in life after sport, because Interestingly, everyone on the panel is past their sports life. Um, I still play wiffle ball, though. <laughs> Except for Jim. Um, I can still walk. <laughs> <laughs> what is, how do you come back from a big loss, whether that is in sport or whether that is out of sport? Yeah. I'll take a shot at it. Um, I think Connor alluded to this earlier. I, I, We've been critical of the industry throughout this panel, but um, sports does instill what I'd consider, and there's research on this now, a growth mindset. Um, so part of the notion of always having a next game, a next practice, is that you're not defined by whatever loss you just experienced in whatever way. A loss on the scoreboard or an injury, maybe you got demoted. Um, the best players aren't the most talented. They're, they're the players that show up again and again and again and again. Um, so that's one huge uh, asset that I feel like I gained from sports, and I think I think we all did. I think I think one of the things I learned from sports is how to lose. You're uh, n nobody. I don't know anybody who's been completely undefeated in every single game. And um, I've had a child die and been through divorce and uh, 
experience all kinds of ups and downs as as everybody in this room has so you yes bad things happen and yes sometimes you lose but the sun will come up and how do we go ahead tomorrow to continue to be human and responsible to each other so i one of the things learning from sports i think especially basketball you play 25 30 games I don't know anybody other than Kareem Abdul-Jabbar who won all of those games. <laughs> he <laughs> lost one. But, uh, <laughs> but that's part of it, resilience. Can I jump in on it too? So I, I think, again, um, my guess is um, most of you are more like me, right? So, so y you never played at a high level. But I did play sports. I played sports all through high school, and I still play sports. And just to echo what Chris said is, it's that resiliency that you get in your everyday life that all of us have to lead. And sometimes that's as hard as just getting up in the morning and go to work because you're, you're tired and you're, you know, it's cold and you just don't want to do it. But having played sports and been around sports my whole life, um, it, you understand things like teamwork and you understand that you have to go to work because you have other people you know, waiting on you and, and, and depending on you. And I absolutely learned, learned those lessons playing sports through high school. Um, and so I think that's, that's the key, and I think it's something we all can relate with as well. Um, so this question was another student question. This one was directed specifically to Hope, but I'm gonna broaden it a little bit because I think there's a wider experience there. Um, so the question is about how do we get people, specifically young girls in sport, to stop measuring themselves by external factors like body size or looks um, or Instagram, which is not part of my sports career, but is now. Um, and so I think that that is applicable to young girls, but also to anyone whose body is their job. Um, how do you separate the physical and the emotional and the external opinion and the internal reality? Yes. Uh, it, it's difficult. I, uh, you know, we want to see these young girls have a sense of confidence, and this is a deeper societal issue. Mm -hmm. When you know what we see on TV, what we see on the magazines, what we talk about, starting at, uh, you know, when a baby comes out of the womb, are they dressed in pink? Do they have a bow around their bare head? Um, are we painting boys' rooms blue? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're. <laughs> it, it's very difficult because we celebrate young girls who dress in princess outfits. We celebrate young girls looking pretty. Um, they get complimented on how cute they are. So this is a very deep societal issue, and I think, uh, you know, we're having these conversations this day, and, and this, this uh, age we're living in, these conversations are, are being had all of the time. Um, do we celebrate gender, or do we really allow these young kids to develop into who they want to be? So. It, I don't think I have the answer for that. Um, I do know that I've been faced with the pressures of being objectified, of mm -hmm. being a sex figure. Um, I've had to face these challenges on how to balance it. And I've also had to make sure that I had confidence in my inner self, but also my outer, my outer self as well. And I have been ridiculed. Mm -hmm. I've been ridiculed when I went on silly Hollywood show, Dancing with the Stars. I got ridiculed for having too much muscle and not looking like a lady. Wow. And instead of accepting it and smiling and being grateful for their advice, I spoke back to the judges, which is what you're not supposed to do. <laughs> and I said, these muscles that you are criticizing helped our country win gold medals. Yes. <laughs> I was never going to apologize for, you know, I think I said on, on uh, the David Letterman show, he, he made a comment, I think, about being a goalkeeper and how hard it is on your body. And I said, absolutely, I'm diving hundred, hundreds of times a day, throwing around 155 pounds, landing hard on my shoulder. And everybody gasped in the audience. They were like, a woman fed her weight on national television? <laughs> Women don't talk about their weight. And it was almost like I was supposed to be ashamed for weighing 155 pounds. Mm. And this is a problem of society, because I'm not ashamed of that. Yep. This, is what, this is the body I created through sport, through lifting, through training. And it has helped me be, become successful. So 
it took me some time. Um, you know, I, I'd go to parties in college, and I'd have a tank top on, and guys would be like, "Oh, you could kick my ass." And I don't know how to take that. Is it a compliment? Are they trying? You know, you don't really know how to take it. So it took some time. It took some, uh, you know, growing up and learning what was important to me. And I sympathize and empathize with you parents out there raising young girls because I don't have advice for you. I don't have the answer. But I know that we live in challenging times. And I hope that you can help these young girls find a sense of confidence in who they are deep inside and not based off of wearing princess dresses and, and makeup and whatever else. I hope you said something earlier that really enlightened me um, in terms of uh, pay inequity. I'd consider that the, the end of the inequity, and because of the endorsements and your reliance upon that, it's really the start of it. Um, you know, I don't think Peyton Manning does nationwide commercials because of sex appeal. Uh -huh. No offense to Peyton Manning. <laughs> Um, so just thank you for that. I, I thought I was um, progressive on the issue, and I, I've got more to learn. That means a lot. Thank you. My husband uh, helped me understand how difficult it really is. I mean, I know the difficulties about being a women athlete, but my husband said to me, you know, I could have done, you know, we, we had opportunities being NFL players, you know, to do these commercials or 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 do make the, make money on the side, but it was never for the money. It was for the celebrity status. Um, it was never. They're not doing these commercials to make money. They're doing it to grow their profile and become famous, more famous than behind the helmet. And my husband said to me, "I never had to be faced with those right. those questions or these challenges." And He's like, I, I now see things from a, a different point of view as a female athlete and what you had to go through because I made my money on the field and that's all I needed to do. I didn't have to do photo shoots. I didn't have to do speaking engagements. I didn't have to do appearances. And it actually made me quite angry because I'm like, all I ever wanted to do was be a professional athlete. I didn't want to be in the, in the spotlight. I didn't want to do commercials or photo shoots, but I had to, to make an adequate living not making millions of dollars, just an adequate living. And I actually got angry because a lot of, well, a lot of footballers, uh, probably baseball players and basketball players, the main sports here in America, uh, the main men's sports here in America, can really do what they love by simply playing the game. Mm -hmm. And I wish we all had that opportunity to do so. Yes, hit it. Yeah. I would just say find your role model. I mean, you've got a stunning one right here um, who has pushed the boundaries in terms of women's rights, equal pay, and everything. I think for me, when I was growing up, I just found my role model. Um, I mean, mine was Didier Kush. He was a downhill ski racer. Um, but young people, young girls, young boys, they just need to find that person that not only echo echoes sports excellence, but personal excellence as well. Um, in the skiing world right now, Michaela Schifrin, I would say, is a, she's a phenom on the slopes, and she's also a phenom in pushing the personal boundaries. Um, she, I, I believe this is the correct statistic, but she made more prize money this year than any male athlete on the World Cup circuit. And I think that's a first, if I'm not mistaken. So we just need more role models like Hope and like Michaela to continue to improve the situation. keep those kids off social media though yeah. because yeah. a lot of their role models yeah, are the ones who uh, have the most followers on social media correct. who knows oh. what they stand for off the field mm -hmm. um, but they certainly you know know what's popular and, and right. sing the right songs and make the right dance moves and wear the right outfits and have the right fashion and that's what I see as a problem is that these young kids spend too much time on social media finding the wrong mm. role models yeah. Yeah. I'm with Hope. I actually disagree. Okay. Um, I, I think find role models that you interact with. Appreciate the, the talent of athletes, but you don't know who they are. Um, find yourself a Dave Ember or a coach like, like Hope had. Um, I had certainly growing up, I had athletes that I idolized only to meet them in some cases or 
or, and be hugely disappointed. Um, also, I think in terms of, of mentoring and coaching, to see and talk with and spend time with someone is invaluable. So I'd encourage the young folks in the audience to find a role model you actually interface with. So we just have a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to give each of you a very challenging assignment. So you each get about 30 seconds to a minute. And um, Basketball Chris talked at the beginning about how sports reveals yourself, or reveals you. What is the characteristic that you felt helped you to both excel, so something that was always present that was revealed by sport, um, what's the characteristic that allowed you to excel that you are most proud to carry with you into non-sport life? I'll start and, and finish with the athletes. Um, <laughs> competitiveness. So even though uh, I brought the comp competitiveness that I had just from playing high school sports into everything that I do. And so the second half, the first half of my career was in public relations. Second half was on the business side because I wanted a scorecard attached to my career and that scorecard is building our business, getting more kids playing baseball in, in Asia now in places like Africa and South America and Europe. So the, the competitiveness that I got from playing sports and I've seen from being around people like the, the guys up here, the folks up here, that's helped me every single day of my life. Uh, I would just say self-belief and resilience. I know resilience has been talked about a lot on this stage, um, but even say from uh, my Olympic Games, I fractured my shoulder the day after I carried the flag for my country, um, and I was told by many you know, kind of politicians and, and figures that I wasn't going to be allowed to compete. Um, and I basically just told them to, you know, expletive themselves. But um, you have to really just you know look inside yourself and find that extra strength that you maybe didn't exist before um, and how to apply it in your daily life I mean again after the games for me um, this is kind of touching on the mental health thing um, I didn't have sport as an avenue I was down honestly for probably two or three years trying to find what I wanted to do next and you just got to keep searching inside yourself you got to keep being resilient against external and internal factors in order to continue uh, to be an excellent person throughout all, uh, all facets of life. I'll echo what Jim said, but with a twist. So I'll say competitiveness, um, but one of my role models that didn't disappoint was a guy named David Megacy. David played in the NFL for a number of years. He actually retired and quit over protest of, of the Vietnam War and the NFL's support of it wrote a book called Out of Their League. Uh, I met David in college, um, and he was talking about competitiveness and shared the Latin root. Basketball Chris does the Greek, football Chris will do the Latin. <laughs> Competitive, compete comes from calm, which is community, togetherness, and pater, which loosely means to aim for. So together we aim for. I think oftentimes we have like a Gordon Gecko version of competitiveness, like destroy your opponent, kill them, beat them. You should appreciate, love, and respect your opponent. Uh, compete together to make one another better. I know that sounds hunky-dory or whatever. Uh, I think it's very real. And you know, amongst other pro or college athletes, or high school athletes, there's a tremendous amount of mutual respect when you compete in that way. This seems so cliche and not very intellectual, but it is true. It's about resilience. That's what I'm most proud of in my career on the field and off the field. Um, you get knocked down, you get up, and you keep fighting. That's so cliche. A much more eloquent way to say it, and I'm not one to quote scripture, but it's okay. Persecute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but this is actually it, this is a challenge for you. I hope you know it. Okay, good. Persecuted, not forsaken, cast down, not destroyed. Uh, can we, can we note that she just made that a competitive moment? <laughs> this is my teammate. <laughs> to strive together. I'm not sure I have any great moral virtues, but I was always pretty good at being able to pass. And uh, for those of three people who know about the Princeton offense, we have no plays. There's a lot of motion. And somebody has to do all the passing and setting so everybody else up. And that was... Uh, my role for uh, four years. So, uh, so that, that 
led me in later life, in order to throw a good pass, you have to really know who your teammates are and where they're going and uh, what they're able to do. And so I think that has helped me in, as a parish pastor and as a chaplain and as a college president. Who, who else is out on the court? Where are they going? What's the defense trying to do? And to try to pay attention to the movement of, of the game and be sensitive to other people and let them have the ball when they're able to do something or even though they think they may be able to do something, no, don't give them the ball. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for participating today. Uh -huh. Thank you guys. Are they okay? Yeah. 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 Yeah.